Welcome to Simply Christianity. In this week's video, I'm really excited to announce I'm launching a new series of videos. So they're going to have the same theme as we go along. What these videos are going to do is they're going to provide you with a basic outline, short overviews of different arguments that support the Christian claim of the Christian God. That is a God that is all-powerful, all-knowing, um, omnibenevolent or all-good, uh, loves us, just, merciful, etc., etc., etc. Anything that I've talked about in other videos, anybody, you know, anything, anything that would that would mean the Christian God. Now, disclaimer before I go into the first episode, this episode, is not all these arguments are going to prove every single part of the list. However, together, they're going to get us somewhere close, and at the very least, what they're going to do is show us that there is some kind of thing out there. There's some supernatural being, some supernatural entity, which has certain properties that Christianity explains the best. That's how these arguments work for Christianity. A lot of atheists will talk about how even if these arguments were true, they don't get to the Christian God. And that's true to a certain degree. Basically, they don't get you all the way, but that's why Christianity is here. The Bible, revelation, um, general revelation, this idea of Jesus coming as a person, as a historical figure, and telling us who he is, and measuring those um, ideas and whatnot, those show us who God is. Basically, these get you to that step where Christianity can then come in in full force and say, and here's who he is. We know who this being is that you've, you know, that you've shown to exist kind of a thing. So let's get right into it. First episode is on the fine-tuning argument. So what is fine-tuning? Well, I think the best explanation for it is with a piano. A piano, in order to work properly, in order for the notes on the piano to exist, if you will, you need to have the piano tuned. If it's not tuned when you play a G or an A or any of the other notes on the piano, if it's not tuned, it's not going to produce that note. So, if you leave it in your basement, if you leave it in your apartment, if you leave it in your study or your living room, it's not going to tune itself. It's just going to collect dust and get even more out of tune, potentially. What you need is you need a being, an entity, someone with a will, to come in and purposefully, willfully tune it, tweak it, make it so that it produces the right notes. That's the essence of the fine-tuning argument. Basically, it claims that the universe is fine-tuned for life and discoverability. It's two parts, life and discoverability. The first part I'm going to talk about now, fine-tuning for life. The anthropic fine-tuning, just means fine-tuning for life, is basically the claim that the universe is fine-tuned to produce intelligent life. What does this mean? Basically, what this means is that the universe has, you know, been tweaked. It looks like it's been tuned in order that intelligent beings such as humans could exist, could arise. How do we prove this? Well, first, we have to prove that the universe is, in fact, fine-tuned. Because once we prove that, the fact that there needs to be a tuner is pretty much self-explanatory, it's self-evident. So we have to prove that it's fine-tuned. And how do we do this? We look at the physical constants of the universe. And what are these constants? These are constants that are in equations in physics that stay constant no matter what you change about the equations. So in the gravitational equation, you have mass and distance determines the gravity, but you also have the gravitational constant, capital G, and this does not change no matter what you're looking at, no matter where you are. That gravitational constant stays the same. It stays constant. And these are the things we look at to see, what if we change those? What happens if we change these constants? And what physicists have found out is that if we change those constants, the laws of the universe change so dramatically with just these tiny microscopic tweaks to these numbers, the, the universe itself changes so much that life could not possibly exist. Gravity is one of these, but the easiest way to show how this is the case is with the cosmological constant. This constant is found in the cosmological equation, which determines how fast the universe is expanding. Too big, the universe expands too fast for life to even begin to exist because no atoms, nothing ever comes together. And so you can't have life, any kind of life, even a life we, could even, you know, we couldn't even dream of. We could have no life whatsoever, no matter what, no matter how good your imagination is. If no atoms ever came together, you could never have life. If no particles ever were able to come together because that number was too big. Too small, you have the opposite problem. Everything comes together, nothing comes out of, you know, everything coming together. When everything comes together, no life can exist there either, none that we can imagine. So, and even ones we can't imagine, like there, there is no way for intelligent life to exist on either extreme. And those extremes are reached not by extreme numbers, not by extreme changes, but by tiny little tweaks to this number, this cosmological constant. 
So what do we do then? We show that it is very improbable that we live in a that the universe was able to get this number spot on by chance. So what do we do for that? We take we go back to the physicists and we get them to give us a livable range, a range of numbers for the constants that would allow us to live in a universe. We take that range against the possible range of different numbers. I don't know how that's determined methodologically, so you have to look that up on your own. Too hard to explain in this short video, but they take a list of all possible values, compare to a list of livable values, and then develop a probability. And for the cosmological constant, the probability that you and me came about in a universe that was not governed by some kind of tuner, or some kind of creator, is 1 in 10 to the 120th power. That is an astronomically big number. That means it's an astronomically small probability to the point of effectively being zero. So this shows that the hypothesis that we arose in a universe, that the universe is in such that the universe is tuned in such a way that we could live is almost impossible to explain. It is impossible to explain by chance. The chances are so small, it's a very bad hypothesis. So th this argument's good. It does have some flaws, which I won't get into here, but they're pretty much solved by many of the Christian apologists you can find. Um, if you do have specific ones, please comment below. I would love to discuss and dialogue with you about why I think that those objections don't actually work against this argument. Um, but the big reason I don't think any of the objections really matters is because of the second part. The um, uh, fine-tuning for discoverability really addresses a lot of these um, arguments and they haven't you know atheists have yet to come up with a really good explanation for fine tuning for discoverability and that's why it's so exciting so fine tuning for discoverability is the same exact premise except instead of the livable range it's a discoverability range uh, what this means is that there are constants out there that you know some of them deal with how we can live but others deal with science um, discoverability that's the only word i can think of these constants dictate what we can discover in, in, in uh, indirect ways. So the best way I can, I can explain is give an actual example. And before I go into it, I want to give a plug to Dr. Robin Collins. He was a professor of mine at Messiah College. He's the head of the philosophy department. He has a physics degree and philosophy degree. He's done amazing work on this subject, and he's the one who's, who's doing kind of the groundbreaking um, leader in this, in this area of apologetics. And it's taking you know, the apologetic world by storm quite literally, in these past couple of years. But back to the argument, the best way I can explain what this is is looking at one specific uh, constant, and it's the structure constant, it's called. It's called a structure constant. It's denoted by alpha and whatever equation it's in. I don't know if it's called a structure equation. This equation governs a lot of things, but one thing it governs um, quite closely is the, the way wood burns. It seems kind of arbitrary, but the way wood burns... Um, it, it, it determines fire in general. Basically, if you're too far one way, we never see flame. So we never know that fire is there. And you can imagine how hard it would be to not just live in a world where we couldn't see fire. It'd still be doable. But how could we discover anything? You know that fire was so foundational in scientific discovery and humans advancing throughout society was this, this fire. So without that, we don't really have any discoverability. The opposite is that fire incinerates wood and, and other materials just incredibly fast and so again we never discover fire we can never harness fire we can't do anything with fire we never advance to the technological age we're in and again just with the cosmological constant once they determine the range of discoverable values they do it with the range of actually living values i think is what they do and then that probability is really really small and then if you actually take it to the range of possible values it's even smaller to the point of it being even worse than the other points but basically, these constants and, and other ones are even are even more important, um, like the Higgs boson particle, or yeah, the Higgs boson particle. Its mass, the 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 constant which governs its mass, is incredibly important with modern um, astro uh, astronomy, not astrology, astronomy, and, and how we can discover things about the universe we're in. And again, I really encourage you to look it all up uh, on your own. I'm gonna link a long video about a uh, 50. Uh, a 45 minute video down below that actually is Dr. Robin Collins giving a lecture on the fine tuning for discoverability. He goes into that alpha constant and goes into some of the methodology if you have questions about that. But basically, this, this is the primary argument is that the universe is fine tuned because the probability that we were to exist and be able to discover things about our universe is astronomically small to the point of zero. So it's a terrible scientific hypothesis to hypothesize we got here by chance. 
So, I mean, I really think this argument is really strong. And the discoverability argument is so strong. It's got a lot of atheists, not worried, but, but it has them on their heels. They're, they're trying to come up with different ways to explain this away. And I, I do want to touch on the one way that they do try and address it is with multiple universes. Basically, with multiple universe hypothesis, they try and hypothesize that um, there are so many universes out there that, it, that there's more universes than the probability. So it makes the probabilities not as important because once you have a big enough sample size, you know, the probabilities don't matter as much. Like if you have a probability of one and two and you flip a coin a thousand times, you're going to get heads and tails most likely. So that's what they do. They kind of do the same thing. They're going to flip the coin so many, an infinite number of times in order so that our, our specific universe comes up. This suffers many problems. One, it's not supported by any science. There's no evidence for multiple universes. So it's a completely made-up theory just to detract from Christianity, just to detract from religion. And it really shows the, 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 uh, the ignorance of the scientific community when it comes to some of these things. They accuse you know, Christians and the like of using the gods of the gaps theory, which is this idea that when we don't know something, we use God to explain it. And that's true. That has been done in the past, and it's a terrible argument. Please do not do it. Please do not use that argument. It's a terrible argument. It gives Christians a really bad name. But we have an example of the scientific you know, science of the gaps. The science of the gaps is this, this multiple universe hypothesis. They've, they've come up with literally out of thin air to try and explain this way. That's how powerful these arguments are, is that they've come up with a theory out of thin air with no evidence in order to explain it away. So I hope this video was helpful. Um, I hope you understand what fine-tuning is, why it's such a powerful argument, and that it explains that you, there, there has to be some kind of transcendent tuner. There has to be some creator to the universe. Um, and that creator also has to love beauty. He has to, he has to love us. He has to value us. He has to want us to know more about him and the universe he's created us in. And, you know, that's why I like the discoverability part, because it doesn't just get us the all-powerful, all-knowing part. You know, the... the the boring part, if you will. It gets us the heart of the Christian God. And that's why I love this argument is because it really kind of defeats what the atheists usually say. They like, oh, that doesn't get you the Christian guy. Like, this gets you super close. And this is just a philosophical argument. It doesn't get you Jesus Christ himself. It doesn't prove that he was God or anything like that. But it gets you so close to the God that Christianity describes. And then again, that opens the doors for Christians to come in and say, you, you, you've seen that this, this God, this thing probably exists. Let me tell you who he is. And, and as Christian, I encourage you, if you are a Christian, to use that kind of, uh, you, use that, you know. Use the fine-tuning argument to bring down intellectual barriers to show that Christianity is rational, that it is, you know, smart people can believe in this. It is rational to believe in Christianity. It doesn't go against what we know about the world. In fact, it supports it a great deal. So I can't wait to do the next video next week. In fact, if you want to keep up to date, please subscribe. Please like the video so I know how often you want me to do this series, how, how often you want me to produce videos that fall into the same category. Again, this is more like an index, uh, a, a, um, a table of contents to Christian arguments. So if you have any specific questions, please fill up the comments. I am more than happy to spend you know, even hours answering comments about um, fine-tuning. I can do my own research some more figure out things. And if you have any objections to this argument, please put them below. I'd love to answer and, and uh, respond to those objections because I think this argument has great responses to all the objections out there. So I hope this shows you that Christians have one good argument and I hope to show you so many more as more videos come out. So I can't wait to see you next time.